I'd like to welcome Anthony Lowenstein. Uh, Anthony, Anthony, we had wanted to uh, interview you at Diwan on your latest book uh, titled The Palestine Laboratory, Laboratory, How Israel Exports the Technology of Occupation Around the World. Uh, many thanks for, for agreeing to do this. Thanks um, for having me. Uh, just to for our uh, listeners, you're an Australian German investigative journalist and author who has written a number of books on topics as varied as the Israel-Palestine question, capitalism, and the war on drugs. And when we post this interview, we will we will list several of your books. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Your latest book, The Palestine Laboratory, Laboratory or, or Laboratory, whichever works best, um, describes how Israel has marketed internationally the instruments of control and rep repression over the Palestinian population. Um, why did you choose to cover this topic and what were your main conclusions? So I've been covering Israel-Palestine for about 20 years. I lived for a number of years there in East Jerusalem between 2016 and 2020. And during that period, there started to be some reporting some people remember around Pegasus, the Israeli spyware that ended up on lots of people's phones, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, and essentially it allows, usually it's a country or an intelligence service to essentially hack your phone to get all the information from your phone, usually without your knowledge. And this was getting some international news coverage. Some of it was quite good. Some of it was a bit myopic. But what frustrated me was that at two often the coverage ignored the wider context, which somehow framed it as this is rogue Israeli company selling this very powerful hardware to regimes around the world, Saudi Arabia, India. Now, that's not on one level untrue to the extent that those tools are being sold to other nations. And we can talk about that if you like. But I felt like it wasn't explaining the wider context, which was that what Israel has been doing for years and Pegasus is just one part of that bigger picture, is testing and trialling huge amounts of tools and technologies of repression on Palestinians in Palestine, which are then sold and promoted as so-called battle-tested around the world. And what was too often not being made, the connection around, say, Pegasus, was that tools like that actually are an arm of the Israeli state there's the company that made it NSO as a private company. It has a board, et cetera. But in reality, it was used by Netanyahu for the last 10, 15 years as a key diplomatic tool to try to make friends. And this started about 15 or so years ago. So I wanted to expand that and report on that both from Palestine itself, but also globally. Well, we're in the middle of a war in Gaza today, of course, um, which in many respects appears to have gone against the, shall I put it, the Israeli brand as a successful controller of the Palestinian population. How would you gauge the conflict in Gaza as the impact of the conflict in Gaza on this image that Israel uh, tried to sell of itself being a successful manager, if I could use the term, mm. of the Palestinian population, which is the topic of your book? Look, there's no doubt that October 7 was an Israeli catastrophic failure. I mean, there's no other way to regard that intelligence-wise, militarily, politically. That's true. And as I talk about in the book, uh, Gaza was often seen as the ultimate testing ground for weapons of both um, killing but also surveillance. But I would actually suggest that, in fact, what we've seen in the last three months is after the brutal Hamas massacres on that day, the Israeli response has been utterly overwhelming, brutal, 25, 30,000 Palestinians killed. And in that period, apart from all the coverage that many people will have followed, Israel's also been doing what it always does, which is tests and tries new weapons of killing and surveillance. And I mention that because I am far from convinced that the failures of October 7 from the Israeli perspective, are going to have much negative impact on the Israeli arms industry. Let me briefly explain why. So the 2022 figures we have from Israel, which is the latest we have, show that it was $12.5 billion US dollars, which had been sold in that year. That was mostly 24% were from Arab autocracies. Other nations were Africa and South America and Asia. 
and we don't have the 2023 figures yet. They'll come out in about four, five, four or five months. But I'm moderately confident that, in fact, they're going to be a record number or very close to. And I say that because after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2023, 2022, I should say, huge amounts of European nations flocked to Israel desperate for buying missile defense shields and other kinds of weapons. I would suggest what happened on October 7 will have zero impact zero impact on those kinds of sales, A, and B, the kind of tools that Israel's using to currently fight its war in Gaza, including AI-enabled warfare, which despite Israel's claims, in fact, is killing more civilians, not less. When Israel is using these tools, they're promoting them on social media across their platforms. That's not just for a domestic Israeli audience and a global audience in an attempt to try to get people to support Israel. I don't think it's been very successful these days, but they're trying. But also it's to other nations in an attempt to try to get them, to convince them that these are the kind of tools you need to fight a so-called war on terror. So yes, 7 of October was a disaster. We still don't know all the facts, what happened and why. We'll find that out in the coming months and years. But I would suggest that in fact, although it clearly dented Israel's image, to be sure, I actually think that many nations out of solidarity and apart from the other reasons I gave before will in fact to continue to support Israeli arms industry and it'll do very well. As briefly, after 9-11, which is clearly a massive intelligence failure of the US, Israeli defense companies were never more successful. Lockheed Martin, Rayathon. In fact, the more wars that America fought, the more successful they were. And I'm not suggesting those wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was solely for Lockheed Martin. I don't believe that for a second. But those companies benefited, no doubt. And I think in Israel, you'll find a similar situation. Well, let's step back a bit. I mean, what are the main fields in which um, Israel has made progress in marketing its wares? Um, we're talk what kind of things are we talking about? And what are the types of governments that have, that have bought these, uh, the, uh, these Israeli products? And uh, could you sort yeah. of inform us on this? So definitely, I mean, it's there's been so much, but in the 21st century, so in the last 23, 24 years, the main products are drones, um, biometric tools, facial recognition technology, uh, mass surveillance, and the one I mentioned before, or Pegasus spyware. And in terms of who's been buying it, you know, it's easier to look at the countries that have not because... In the last decades, and especially since 9-11, we don't know the exact number of countries that have bought these tools and weapons, but I estimate anywhere between 125 and 140, so essentially the majority of nations on the planet, democracies and dictatorships. So who are we talking about? Everything from India to Bangladesh, France to nations in um, Africa, China, uh, the vast bulk of the Middle East. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco. As far as we know, Israel does not sell to, say, Iran, Syria, and North Korea. I mean, I'm not saying it's never happened. In fact, in fact, I detail in the book. Before 1979, Israel and Iran were very, very close, remarkably close. And Israel sold huge amounts of equipment to that deeply repressive regime. Obviously, that's changed a lot in the last decades, although the Iran-Contra affair was exactly about that. But since then, as far as we're aware, there hasn't been any. So all these tools, for example, when it comes to the Arab states, and there are some exceptions, such as Lebanon, as far as we're aware again, but many Arab states have bought. And I argue in the book that most of the Arab nations were utterly petrified by the Arab Spring. The idea that people would rise up, would challenge their rule, and they were desperate for repressive technology to make sure that never happens again, either in the nations where it did happen or nations where it did not. And Israel was a willing seller. They were open to, A, become more friendly with Arab states as a way to try to so-called normalize their relations. And it's important just to note, since October 7 and the Israeli response in the last three or so months, I always say, ignore what countries say, look at what they do. And practically speaking, yes, Arab states, I'm talking about leaders now, have been critical of Israel, to be sure. 
but no one's cut ties and I can tell you no one will not because I'm saying they all love what Israel's doing I mean they probably don't virtually no Arab state's a big fan of Hamas Qatar is a slight exception to that for a variety of reasons but in general most Arab states have no love for Hamas and wouldn't care if they got, got obliterated tomorrow but they're not going to cut ties with Israel and in fact as much as you can take Antony Blinken's word at face value, which you probably shouldn't, but let's just say for argument's sake that you can, he's been in the Middle East at the moment this week, first week of 2024, saying, yes, many Arab states I'm speaking to, including Saudi, are happy to still imagine normalising relations with Israel. And I actually believe that. I don't think that's just uh, bollocks. I think it's probably true. So what does that say? That says to me that... The reason why so many people in the Arab world were so angry with their leaders in 2010, 2011 with the Arab Spring was the idea, it wasn't just about Palestine, of course, economic crisis and various other reasons, was that these leaders don't speak for them, don't represent them. And when it comes to Palestine, as we know, much of the Arab world, I'm generalizing here, but the vast bulk of the Arab Muslim world supports Palestine. And yet again, we show that the disconnect between Arab states and their people. And I mentioned that in the context of what Israel's been doing, because all those states are looking at what Israel's doing in Gaza, despite what they say, with admiration. They will want some of the weapons and tools and technologies that Israel's been using in Gaza. When you have 24% in 2022 of the Israeli arms sales went to Arab autocracies, 24, so essentially a quarter, what does that say to you? It's a massive number, and I think it's going to only increase. We make the very interesting point in your book that Israel appeals particularly, I mean, while you're saying that they, of course, sell this to everyone, but you say it appeals particularly to uh, ethno-nationalist governments in the world. And I'm curious, I mean, what did you mean by that? You know, when I was thinking about that term, and obviously I'm not the only one who uses it, I was thinking particularly of states like India, in the modern era. So India, of course, has had uh, a far-right Hindu fundamentalist leader, uh, Prime Minister Modi, since 2014, so now roughly 10 years. And there's obviously been very right-wing Indian governments before his, but what he's done in the last 10 years, with its pretty clear majority Indian support, there is dissent, to be sure, but minor, sadly. What His vision for India is to create a Hindu fundamentalist state to isolate, target, and God forbid, even worse, to the 200 million or so Muslims in India. And it's not just my opinion. I mean, this is happening. There are pogroms regularly against Muslims. There are regular, both rhetorical and physical attacks. Now, what's that got to do with Israel? India is doing what India wants to do. It's not doing it because of Israel. But what is happening, and I make the comparison in the book between Israel and India today, and Israel and apartheid South Africa back in the day, is that there's an ideological alignment. There's a belief that in Israel, of course, they believe they have the right to be a Jewish supremacist state, whereas in India, they believe they have the right to be a Hindu fundamentalist state. And they share ideas. So a few years ago, you have Indian officials openly talking about how much they admire what Israel is doing in the occupied West Bank saying we want to do something very similar in Kashmir. Now, what in, again, what India is doing in Kashmir is not because of Israel, but it's inspired by it. And what India has been doing in the last years in Kashmir, which is a Muslim-majority part of a majority Hindu country, is to bring huge amounts of Hindus from the south to the north, deeply militarised. Essentially, it's a dictatorship in the north in Kashmir. And India has also become one of, Israel's largest purchase of weapons, everything from surveillance to other kinds of arms. So to me, the danger of ethno-nationalism, which maybe is obvious, is that nations like India, which are now hugely influential, very close to the US because it's not China, and therefore Biden or, frankly, Trump, if he gets back in this year, I don't think they'll make much difference on this issue, are keen to cozy up to Modi, and Modi's facing re-election this year, almost certainly will win because the opposition is disjointed and not that popular and being suppressed. 
So he's almost certain to get another five-year term. So to me, the warning of ethnic nationalism, I, I would argue that Israel is building a loose global coalition of like-minded nations. India is the main one. Hungary is another one. Hungary is a relatively small country, what, 10 million people in Europe, but very influential in terms of inspiring the Republican right in the US. So I see what Israel is pushing in its own country in to do something similar within their borders. Well, we see, of course, an irony of what you've just said today, because we have in The Hague the, the accusation against Israel of genocide by South Africa. The wheel of fortune, apparently, you know, the wheel of fortune turns now and then if you're de dealing with an ethno-nationalist state. And sometimes the, the minority, well, in that case, the majority eventually takes control and it can have... Uh, significant push you know um, blowback i think mm. Mm. um just one thing uh, on the pegasus you you had a very interesting comment in your opening remarks on on the issue of how nso the company that uh, basically manufactured the pegasus uh, uh, spyware was close to the israeli government mm. i mean can you give us just very briefly, a sense of how yeah. close this relationship is and what does it involve? So what it practically means is that Israel, under Netanyahu, who's basically been prime minister for most of the last 15, 16 years, along with the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, would regularly use Pegasus as a diplomatic tool. And I mentioned in detail in the book what this means. And what it practically means is they would go to country X or country Y often a nation they didn't have close relations with or as good relations as they wanted. I'm talking about Saudi, India, Rwanda, the list goes on. And they would essentially say, we will sell you this amazing tool. We can go after your dissidents, human rights activists, troublemakers, critics. But in return, we would like you to, for example, support us more in the UN or other international forums. And I document in the book very closely that when Netanyahu or the Mossad would go to certain places within six or 12 months, it was pretty clear that Pegasus had been used against critics in those countries. So sources of mine within Israel have said to me that, and I put this in the book, that what when Israel is selling Pegasus, there is not really an attempt to try to separate it from the company. Now, of course, in the last few years, NSO Group itself is in a bit of financial trouble. The Biden administration comes in two or so years ago, three years ago now, and have sanctioned NSO Group under the guise of saying we're very concerned about human rights with spyware. Now, it'd be nice if that was true, but as I say in the book, I don't see this as any care of the US towards Israeli spyware, what they're concerned about, they being the US, is American companies coming second best. That Israeli spyware companies are now global leaders and American companies are not. And they're attempting to try to neuter Israeli firms. And of course, if, as I say in the book, if NSO Group disappears tomorrow and it's facing a lot of financial troubles, it makes no difference. Because in the last years, I would argue cleverer, cleverer savvier, much quieter Israeli companies have come up doing exactly the same thing, selling to the most repressive states in the world. They don't care. There's no real checks or balances within the Israeli state because one of the things I talk about in the book is that, of course, there are some Israeli Jews who are outraged, including key sources in my book, outraged by what Israel has been doing, for sure. But overall, there is this weird sense within Israel, having lived there for a long time, I'm Jewish, although I'm not an Israeli citizen by any means, of, it's like a pride almost in saying, have a look, our tools, they sold all over the world without really looking, okay, sure, but what actually are you selling? You are selling weapons and spyware and tools of destruction. And I think there is this disconnect in much of, I don't even think it's just Israeli society, I would argue Jewish diaspora society, which is a separate issue, which I talk about in other in the book, but in other works of mine. But I argue that there has been a moral collapse in much of the global Jewish community since 1948, the establishment of Israel. Of course, there's Jewish critics, there always has been, they exist. I'm one of them, and I'm not the only one. But in general, Israel can only do what it does 
with global Jewish diaspora support. That's the reality. And you've seen since October 7, again, with some notable exceptions, big protests in the US of dissident Jews, but in general, pretty much in the US and Europe and the UK, virtually all the mainstream Jewish organisations lockstep with Israel. And that's important in relation particularly to the arms industry because that allows Israel to claim we're being attacked by everybody, but look at us, we're showing pride in what we're creating rather than saying, yeah, but you're creating weapons of death or surveillance. Final two questions very briefly, uh, Anthony. The first is that you had a very you have a very interesting chapter on how uh, Israel has sought to influence uh, social media. Um, could you very briefly tell us uh, mm. what that's about and in a way, what's the purpose and how do they do so? Let me briefly explain that, but this bit of context, which of course is not in the book, because the book came out in May last year before October 7. And we've seen since October 7, for anyone who's been active on social media as I am, whether it's uh, not so much Twitter, but Instagram, obviously owned by Facebook, mass amounts of censorship and so-called shadow banning. For those who don't know, shadow banning, for those who don't know what it means, is you're not removed but very few people will see your posts. So therefore there's some some way to screw with the algorithm and you're therefore down the down the pi bottom of the pile. So what I document in the book is that in the last 10 or so years, Israel realized that the narrative that they had in many ways successfully pushed for decades of their own existence, their own identity, which they were able to control when there was only a handful of media outlets. Suddenly social media challenges all that, that there's competition, there's millions of other people, billions of people, and there were all these voices that all of a sudden, Palestinians in Palestine, but also just people in general, who were very critical of what Israel was doing, and they didn't know how to manage that. So what they started to do, they being Israel, would started to lobby and pressure the social media companies. So I'm talking about uh, Google Facebook, Twitter, both before Elon Musk took over and since Musk took over it a few years ago. And I document this in the book that had huge amounts of success in a way, success in inverted commas, mean that they're able to convince these companies that they are allowing anti-Semitic content online. This is outrageous. You must remove it. Now, I'm not suggesting anti-Semitism doesn't exist online. Undeniably, it does. And I'm, my understanding is since Musk took over Twitter, it's exploded. But most of what they're removing is not anti-Semitic. It's critical of the occupation, critical of what Israel's doing, showing the violence that settlers may be meting out to Palestinians. And this is one of the cases where there's a slight grounds for optimism that although Israel's massively pressuring these companies to censor content, and these companies mostly, as I say in the book, their worldview is largely mirrored by what the state, the US State Department says about issue X or issue Y. So that's the first thing. So obviously very, very pro-Israel, but less, not that I'm saying one should be pro-Hamas, for example, by any means. But if there's work that is, say, critical of Israel that someone would perceive as pro-Hamas, that may get removed, either by a person or by a machine. And finally, I would say, in fact, that Despite all that, Israel is still losing the PR battle. And I'm not just talking about since October 7, although certainly since. And what I mean by that briefly is that, yes, Israel has arguably one of the most sophisticated, well-funded, they call it a Hasbara, sort of Israeli propaganda arms in the world. And it's certainly successful with governments. I mean, we've seen this in the last three months, that virtually every single Western government gives Israel 110% support. But that's different in the public. And you look at public opinion polls in the US, for example, with people between 18 to 35, since October 7 and certainly before, many, if not most, aren't necessarily supporting Hamas. Some do, but many don't, but are deeply, deeply angry with what Israel is doing. And to me, social media has played a key role in that over the years, showing Palestinian lives, as we've seen in the last few months, showing Palestinians, because there's no foreign journalists in Gaza. So yes, you have, of course, Israel's killing a hundred odd journalists, shamefully, but there are still Palestinians who are on Twitter and Instagram and whatever other platforms they're using. And that has been 
I think, unbelievably influential. So Israel's fighting a battle. I would argue they're not likely to win in the end. Well, that, that's a perfect segue to the last question uh, to Anthony. I mean, you write in your book, and I quote, Israel and its supporters must make a choice between their commitment to Zionism and adherence to liberal values, unquote. Given everything that we've been discussing in, uh, together, what is Israel's future if its model is an open-ended effort to dominate and suppress the Palestinian population under its authority? In other words, even if it's been able to successfully market its instruments of repression and control, will this be enough to reverse the reality of the Palestinian presence? They're not going away. They're not going away. Although, of course, as many people watching and listening to this will be aware, since October 7, the calls to try to remove as, as many Palestinians as possible is getting louder. Now, of course, I'm very hopeful that doesn't happen, suffice to say. But look... And in fact, I that think, would only strengthen your point if they do. That would only strengthen the point in that statement of yours yes. uh, that I read, if they actually do succeed in ethnically cleansing them. I mean, of course, what is happening, as everyone is well aware, is that Israel is making Gaza uninhabitable anyway. So for the roughly 2.3 million Palestinians who are there and very few have left, some have, uh, but most are still there living, you know, hand to mouth day to day. Look... <laughs> I think in the short to medium term, barring some kind of real reversal from the US, which clearly is the major player in this, whether it's Biden or Trump, it's honestly pretty hard to see, even if Trump had been president now, what difference it would have made, frankly. Maybe there would have been more Palestinians killed. I guess that's, it's always it can always be worse. But I think there is still a short to medium term likelihood that Israel will continue its colonization program. I do not see any serious international pressure to stop that. I'm talking about in the West Bank particularly, but also certainly in Gaza. Whether that's settlements, I don't know. But in terms of uh, huge amounts of mass domination, I I do very much see it as a similarity to South African apartheid, where for decades and decades and decades, the vast bulk of the international elite supported it, including Israel, of course. And eventually, after decades and decades of mass resistance from the public, finally, in the end, by you know the late 80s, it was deemed to be unsustainable. And by 1994, Mandela was present now. I'm not for a second saying South Africa today is utopian. Many argue that, in fact, there's still economic apartheid there. South Africa is a deeply troubled society, to be sure. But at least officially apartheid ended in 1994. And I think Israel is in a period, and this is what I've been saying a lot in the last months that people aren't aware, Israeli Jewish society has been radicalised for years it's so easy for the Western press to focus on a handful of crazy far-right extremist members of the Israeli government, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, who are undeniably extremists. But the fact is, in the last three months, there have been public opinion polls, and I quote some of these in the book before October 7, the majority of Israeli Jews polled support the idea of Palestinians from Gaza not being there. Now, <laughs> that's not a handful of random far-right lunatics in the Israeli cabinet, I think that radicalization is not acknowledged by much of the West. Again, I'm not saying all Israelis, of course, I've got Israeli friends, maybe you do too, who are fighting against that and resisting it. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm saying a sizable majority of people have been radicalized, and I fear that October 7 is going to make that worse. So I think in the short to medium term, Israel will be a wild beast, and that is a scary prospect. And without massive international pressure, just finally, finally, as friends of mine there always have said for years, Israeli and Palestinian, this will not end, end being democ real democracy internally. In other words, you're not going to have enough Israeli Jews to rise up and say, enough, we must end the occupation. All the likely of Tunis Netanyahu, Benny Gantz, Yair Lapid, we are deluding ourselves if we think they're that different on the key issues. They're not. They're remarkably similar on the West Bank and really on Gaza. So outside pressure is the only solution here.
Well, on that happy note, thank you very much, Anthony. For we we took perhaps more time than we had of your it's time fine. than we intended. Thanks, but thank you so much. It's very My pleasure. Thanks for having me.